Hello, Abarosans and Altruists, my name is TV Skyn, and in our ongoing quest to discuss and sort of categorize and catalog the older champions of League of Legends before Riot can finally get around to updating them and making them more cogent to the modern state of the game, we have hit upon an old friend of mine. So what is the deal, exactly, with Ash? Now, I've spoken extensively about Ash's character design in the past, and just spoiler alert, I don't like it very much, it's not, it's not, it's not great. I'm gonna be recapping a few of my points um, over the course of this video, especially near the end, just to kind of get it in there, but if you want a full breakdown of my many, many problems with Ash's character design, I'm gonna link to a video down in the description where I do, like, a full argument for why her base character design is really, really, really bad. Um, yeah, so for the most part in this video, we're going to be focusing on her lore. We're going to be focusing on the story concepts, and we're going to be doing a little bit of general discussion of the Freljord and sort of the myths and, and the, the narrative patterns that are underlying that particular region. So, Iceborne War Mother of the Avarosan Tribe. Ash commands the most populous horde in the north. Stoic, intelligent, and idealistic, yet uncomfortable with her role as leader, she taps into the ancient ancestral magics of her lineage to wield a bow of true ice. With her people's belief that she is the mythological hero, Avarosa reincarnated, Ash hopes to uni unify the Freljord once more by retaking their ancient tribal lands. So, Ash is the nominal good guy of the Freljord, in the sense that we have um, the, the trio of uh, queens in the Freljord right now. We have Lysandra, we have Sejuani, and we have Ash, who are acting as a kind of perverse mirror, or a kind of repeating of the cycle of the three sisters of the Freljord's past. Now, in case you don't know, the Freljord used to be that there were three great, like, really super just awesome queens who ruled over the Freljord. We had uh, Avarosa, we had... God, what's her name? The second one, the one Sejuani is... is imitating Cylindra? Sultra? Something like that. And then we had Lysandra, who were like, they were the three ancient sisters, super powerful, they were really instrumental in shaping what the Freljord would eventually become. Unfortunately, Lysandra ended up looking into the void and became corrupted and betrayed everyone and everyone died and it was kind of completely freaking awful. And Lysandra managed to survive and hide her role in the terrible things that happened to the Freljord back then. So, over time, what eventually happened was the two more queens would rise to control the Freljord, Sejuani and Ash. And they, in their behavior, are mirroring some of the values, some of the behaviors of those ancient forebears, the Three Sisters. And Lysandra still remains as the only original Three Sister left in the Freljord, whereas Ash um, aspires to the ideals of Avarosa. So you have the cyclical nature of history thing going on where, you know, patterns are repeating themselves and, and things are happening in the same way that they used to, which seems to be leading up to this idea that eventually the Void will break through the Howling Abyss and there will be a great battle to try and contain the Void, to try and beat it back, to try and save um, the world of Terra from the horrors of the Void. And the only way to get that done, the only way to accomplish that battle, and the only way not to lose completely, is to unite all of the Freljord into a single coherent unified force. And even that may not be enough. That, however, doesn't really play into Ash's lore very much, because these are all things that have been invented somewhat after <laughs> Ash's current lore state was defined. So, Let's talk about Ash herself and what's actually going on with her. And there is actually a little bit of interesting stuff happening in her story. So, Ash's bio, she doesn't have a short story for herself, unfortunately, but Ash's bio, in so many words, is that she is the daughter of a leader of a tribe in the Freljord. And her mother, unfortunately, dies um, in a raid on a rival tribe. And Ash decides, rather than seeking revenge for the death of her mother, which is the way of the Freljord, she says, no, no, let's have peace. Let's broker a truce. Let's stop killing each other. It's stupid to kill each other. Let's not kill each other and instead work together and, you know, have more food and things will be better. That doesn't really fly so well with the rest of her tribe who are like, but but blood and 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 killing and and feuding that's that's what that's what freljord people do we we blood and we feud and we kill so they hatch a plot to assassinate ash before she can become you know an effective leader of her people mind you she ash is about 15 at this point so it's like they they're being kind of dicks to a very young girl who's just lost her mother but that's the freljord way the assassins attack ash um but unfortunately she's able to avoid their ambush 
because of a warning from a great hawk that flies above her. And the hawk, eventually, as she's fleeing from the assassins, she follows this hawk, and it leads her to a cairn of stones, which is a burial place. And on that cairn, there's a rune on one of the stones that just says Avarosa. And inside the cairn, Ash finds a magical bow of true ice. And with it, she's able to kill the assassins and return to a tribe where everybody immediately recognizes that, oh boy, that magic true ice bow is the true ice bow of Avarosa. And that means that Ash is now the true inheritor of Avarosa. And because she has this magical symbol of her divine right of queenship, as it were, her tribe begins to swell. A lot of people begin to flock to her banner, and she begins her long and arduous quest to unite the Freljord as a single grand nation and to finally restore peace to that, you know, most fractured region of the world. So Asha's story, essentially, is a version of the Arthurian myth. It's essentially, like, we have a young leader thrust into leadership before they may be ready for it. They are given a magical weapon, you know, that has a this divine providence that signifies, by divine providence, that they are to be the leaders of their region of the world. And you might say that, you know, strange cairns lying about in clearings and hawks distributing magical bows is no basis for a system of government, but I say it's clearly just a divine signal that Avarosa has reincarnated into Ash and therefore divine providence, right, blood right of kings, stuff like that. Ash is the true leader of Freljord. Except maybe, just maybe, there's a little bit of doubt about that. Swain has a voice line interaction with Ash. Now, Swain, if you remember, is possessed by a demon of secret, or rather he possesses a demon of secrets because he has, he has subjugated it, which tells him little things about the various people whose souls he's able to rend from their bodies. And his voice line for Ash goes, she told them it was the grave of Everosa. They believed her. Which implies, it doesn't really confirm, but it implies that maybe, maybe the story that we're being told here in Ash's bio isn't really the whole story. Maybe there's a little bit more to it. Maybe Ash is carrying out just a little bit of a deception in order to serve her grander vision of a united Freljord. Unfortunately, none of that has ever been expanded upon yet because that's how Riot does things. So whether or not Ash is propagating some kind of deception, whether or not that's going to be part of her of a storyline for her in the future where she has to deal with, oh, she maybe didn't tell the whole truth about how she got the bow or whatever. Nobody knows. It's not really in the cards. It's not really clear if any of that is ever going to be expanded upon. What's interesting about this, for me, is that there seems to be a couple of, of a converging things going on with the Freljord. The Freljord is like... It's been, it's been an explored region in League of Legends for a long time. Ash, by the way, is married to Trindamir, um, which is something that m most people probably know about her at this point. But she's married to Trindamir as part of a political alliance to bring their tribes together and sort of advance her cause in becoming a queen of the Freljord, etc., etc. Little weird that that's nowhere in her bio or indeed in her um, in her blurbs or anywhere, but it is on the map. If you go to the map and to the Freljord, uh, there is a place in the Freljord where you, it says in a little text blob that this is where Ash and Trindamir were pledged to each other as husband and wife, yada yada. So we know that they are married, but it does strike me as a little bit odd that that's not at all in her bio, even mentioned a little bit. And that's sort of the thing about older champions like this is that because like the whole Ash and Trindamir marriage thing is part of a lore event that happened way the heck back in the day, like really early days of League of Legends, that was a whole event thing going on where Ash was married to Trindamir, and as part of that in-game lore event, they both got skins where it's King Trindamir and Queen Ash. Um, and that, that was like a whole thing, and that was part of how Riot were sort of trying to do the lore back in the day, and it's a detail that seems to have survived the 2014 lore retcon, but the reason I'm, I'm kind of focusing on it is that it's like, this whole lore thing here is already... I don't know why they wouldn't update it to reflect that. Like, why it wouldn't be anywhere. Like, she has a related champion in Trindamir, but... It's not mentioned. I mean, and the, and the point of me bringing it up is... The Freljord feels a little bit divided between uncertain priorities. Because on the one hand, we have the whole Lysandra storyline, where she is still 
terrified of the Void eventually consuming Runeterra, and she's maybe working to delay the Void from consuming Runeterra, or at least delaying it as long as possible. But once it comes, there's a non-zero chance that Lysandra will be on the side of the Void. And that kind of feels like it's supposed to be the main storyline of the Freljord these days, is the whole, oh, the Void is coming, the Void is coming, we have to be terrified of the Void and stuff, because that's, Nar has been retconned to have his storyline tie into the emergence of the Void in the Howling Abyss, you know, many thousands of years ago. And Nunu, and a lot of their storyline, uh, Nunu, Nunu and uh, Willem, a lot of their storyline is about, you know, the Void is coming, Gotta be ready for the void, because the void is bad, and it's it's gonna come, and it's gonna destroy things. And then, on the other hand, we have this other storyline that's going on, which is this whole Three Sisters cycle of history, where Ash is the nominal good guy working to unite the Freljord, and Sichuani is sort of the, you know, punchy troublemaker who just wants to punch problems until they go away, and Lysandra is the evil schema behind the scenes, who has a secret agenda and stuff like that. And those two things don't really feel unified in the modern lore state of the Freljord. And that's perhaps not so much of a surprise, if we're honest, because again, League of Legends lore is a little bit of a patchwork mess. Insofar as they're related to each other, it seems to me that what Riot are driving at is that Ash, her storyline, her role, is to unite the Freljord eventually, manage to get them all together, and then it's going to turn out, holy crap, the Void is coming, and Lysandra is going to manipulate her into just throwing her army at the Void for as long as possible in order to delay its emergence? Maybe? I'm not... It's, it's really... How exactly these two storylines are supposed to mesh together is not really clear because it hasn't really been explored. What is, like... Because the Void is a world-ending threat. Like, it's literally... It's going to consume the entirety of Terra once it finally manages to break through and fully emerge into 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 Runeterra. Like, that's that's part of the threat of Ikathia. It's part of the threat in the Freljord. And it's something that Riot have been putting more and more focus on recently in, in exploring the ways in which the Void is threatening the fabric of reality on Runeterra. And, like, when you have that world-ending clock just hanging over your head and ticking, ticking, ticking away... The trouble with a world ending like this is, oh my god, it's, it's the end of the world, apocalyptic threat hanging over the head of everyone, is that all other conflicts become petty by comparison. Right? It's like, oh, you're fighting over who gets to call themselves king of this little bit of land. Like, literally, the whole world is going to end and you're fighting over this nonsense. So it's kind of hard to get invested in the whole, oh, can Ash unite the tribes of the Freljord thing, unless there's some kind of clear through line connecting that storyline to what's going on in the Howling Abyss right now. Like, is it a thing where Ash needs to unite the Freljord because only a united Freljord, a full army made of, like, the what, what Iceborns remain in the Freljord and all the Freljordian tribes and all the Freljordian tribesmen and, you know, whatever remains of the Yetis and whatever remains of, like, Yordles in the Freljord. Like, all, of, all of it just, all of them coming together, can they maybe stop the Void? Like, is there a prophecy? Is there some kind of chance? Does Lysandra have a plan that if we throw everything we have at them, maybe we can hold them back for another thousand years? Is that what's going on here? Not really clear. It's not clear how they fit together, and that's going to be one of the projects that Riot will eventually have to work on, is reconciling these rather disparate storylines to make it clear what is Ash's relationship to that Void storyline in this thing? What is Orn's relationship, by the way, to the Void eventually erupting into the Freljord and consuming everything he has ever known? How does Anivia and, and Volibear, how do they match up to this one. How does Trindamir feel about it? He already has this kind of demonic corruption thing going on with his rage, stuff like that. Does, can we tie that into the Void storyline, or is that a separate thing as well? And how the hell does Sichuani relate to any of it? It's all very fractured. It's all very sort of, well, we've got this storyline here and this, that storyline, blah, 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 blah. A whole lot of different stuff going on. But like I said, once you have the threat of the apocalypse hanging over everything, Eventually, you have to clarify how all the other stuff ties into that, because it overshadows everything. Like, the, the, the threat of the apocalypse is an all-consuming narrative threat beyond... It's the same thing with them, if you think of something like Dragon Ball Z. Once Goku is a Super Saiyan, it's like... 
what the hell is going to threaten him, right? Like, it's, 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 it's the problem of constantly escalating power levels. And once you get to the power level of this is going to end the world, like, Vegeta threatens to destroy the entire planet once upon a time. Oh my god, he's going to destroy the entire planet. And then they fight Frieza, who threatens to destroy the entire planet and also a bunch of other planets. And it's like, yeah, but, like, that's still just going to end the world. And then it's Cell. He's going to destroy the planet as well. But then before him, it's the androids. Oh, they're going to destroy the planet. It's the trouble of, of once you get to the apocalyptic scale, it's really hard to escalate the stakes beyond that, and, and all other stakes feel insignificant by comparison. <sighs> there's also, by the way, yes, there's a little bit. Uh, it's not 100% clear if uh, Journey into Freljord, which, which is uh, Quinn and Valor's um, little storyline here, whether it's completely canon anymore, but it mentions Ash briefly. It's essentially Quinn doing a scouting mission for Demacia into the Freljord, where she talks about how, oh, hey, uh, Ash is a pretty good leader, y'all. She's pretty cool. She does she she does good leader stuff, and my bird likes her. And then they kind of move on to talk about Sichuani and Lissandra. Not there's not really a lot there. It's it's mostly just it was mostly just a little exploratory piece, I think, to kind of establish some of the terms of the Freljord in 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 the League of Legends lore. It doesn't really do very much. Which leads us on to her character design. Now, like I said, I've already discussed her character design at length. I'm not going to be spending a whole bunch of time on it. But TLDR, if you don't want to go and watch the other video. She's a lady with her tits out in a, in a miniskirt. And she lives in the Freljord. And she's the queen of the Freljord. But she looks like a forest ranger from some kind of Warcraft high fantasy thing. Which makes sense because Ash is literally the Drow Ranger from Dota, the original Dota, the original Warcraft 3 mod, and the Drow Ranger was essentially an adapted version of the Night Elf, uh, of uh, the Night Elf Archer character model. <sighs> so it really, it's a lot of what Ash is even today harkens back to that history, to that origin in Dota, and it really shows because she doesn't. She's literally hanging out in like a blizzard on top of a mountain and she, she, it's a tiny little mini skirt and the titties out and her thighs and her clothes don't like Freljord aesthetics are pretty well established at this point. It's a lot of fur. It's a lot of metal. It's a lot of thick leather. It's a lot of like, you, you know, big baggy pants and trousers because you dress for the environment in which you live. Ash doesn't look like her clothes were made by people from the Freljord. Like, it doesn't look like a Freljord tailor was the dude who came up with that outfit. It looks like it's the... Came, it's like Demacian, maybe. But it really doesn't look like anywhere in the League of Legends world, because again, it's an ancient character design that has never been updated to fit her current state of the lore. And that's really the crux of my... Like, I don't really care that she's sexy, by the way. That's not really the thing. She's not... Oh, she's not allowed to be sexy. No, no. Whatever. Fine. I don't care that she's sexy, I don't care that she's showing skin from like, oh, women are not allowed, to, not allowed to show skin. I care that she's showing skin because she's showing skin in a blizzard, which is dumb. Like, it's just like, why wouldn't she wear some clothes that are comfortable to wear in the environment that she lives in? And people tend to come back at me, well, uh, but, but the bow of true eyes protects her from the effects of the blizzard. Around. Yeah, I, but... I, that's not the point. It does. It doesn't matter if she could theoretically walk around in that outfit in the Freljord and be fine. What matters is why would she? If 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 it's supposed to be some kind of political theater where look how I can walk through a blizzard without clothes and be fine. That's why I'm a good leader of the Freljord. That's not touched on anywhere in her lore. It's never explored. It's never even suggested that Ash might be given to that kind of showing off and that she relies on that kind of theater in order to preserve her power. That might be an interesting way to go. Like, if you really desperately need to justify the design, sure, I guess you could do that, but that's not in there. That's not part of her lore. Her lore says that she was born in the Freljord, she's a Freljord native, she's lived in the Freljord her entire life, she wears the clothes of the Freljord, she, she's trying to unite the Freljord, she's trying to be a political leader in the Freljord, and she doesn't look like any of those things. Anyway, that's the short version of my many, many complaints about her character design. See the video in the description for more details, which leads us to the end of this video. So in summary, Ash, she's an ancient character. She's been with the game for a very long time. And for that reason, I don't think Riot are probably going to be changing her very much in the final analysis. But they really kind of should 
because she's really, really important to a lot of the storylines that they're setting up for the Freljord, and her role in those storylines desperately needs to be clarified so that we can begin to understand what are the themes that are going on in that particular region. And that's going to be a long-term project that Riot are going to have to undertake across the entirety of the region. It seems like they're slowly getting their ass into gear, doing some work on that, but we'll have to see. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video, there's a like button down below that you can click on that does algorithm things. I don't know. There's also a subscribe button, yada yada, bell icon. You know the drill. You have watched YouTube videos before. If you are so inclined, I do have a Patreon where if you have a dollar that you don't need, that dollar genuinely helps me out quite a lot. Like a dollar, a dollar is like a thousand views, basically. Like that's, that's kind of the scale you have to think about it on is that every single dollar you give to someone, anyone on Patreon counts as like a thousand views on one of their videos. That's that's how much value there is in like even 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 just like a single buck. So if, if, if you want to support me, if you want to support someone else, another YouTuber that you know on Patreon, even a dollar can do a hell of a lot. If you don't want to or if you can't, of course, that's completely OK. I'm just happy that you've watched the video this far, which leads us on to that most cherished tradition <laughs> on my videos, which is when I tell you about the dislike button down below. Oh, yes, the dislike button. Now, if you found yourself in a position of not enjoying this video, then, well, first of all, congratulations on making it to the end. But if you wish to show your displeasure, well, the dislike button is there for that, but the dislike button is not for the faint of heart. The dislike button will test you. It lies at the bottom of a great pit, and within that pit you will find such shadows as will penetrate your mind and show you all the most horrifying visions of videos that you have disliked in the past. All of them. That Vine compilation that was kind of shitty and just stole views from the original creators, oh, you will see that one again. That shitty, shitty meme from ten years ago that's stuck in your head and you can't get it out and keep referencing getting conversations but nobody else knows what the hell you're talking about, oh, you're gonna see that one again. The Harlem shit. Oh, that's in there. Double rainbow. Oh, he's in there. You will have to face all of them if you hope to press the dislike button. So steal yourself, grab your sword, and good luck. Thank you very much for watching.